Conditioning Side Effects in Stem Cell Transplant by Stephen Margosian. Hello, my name is Stephen Margosian, and I'm a senior physician in pediatric hematology oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Boston Children's Hospital. I'm going to be talking to you today about the conditioning side effects in hematopoietic stem cell transplant and what I think every resident should know. The goals of this lecture are uh, to provide an overview of potential emergencies related to specific agents and medications that one might encounter while on call or cross-covering the stem cell transplant unit. This is not meant to be a comprehensive overview of conditioning in general or in organ toxicities. The learning objectives are to understand the potential neurotoxicity and initial management for busulfan and cyclosporin, to know the general fluid management for cyclophosphamide administration and the potential for iatrogenic hyponatremia, to learn why it's bad to canoodle with someone receiving thiotepa, and to understand the common side effects of serotherapy, such as antithymocyte globulin or alemtuzumab. What I want you to think about as we go through this is what information do I want to know, either from the nurse, from your own initial assessment, what are the initial interventions you should be thinking of, both in terms of management and diagnosis? And how quickly should you escalate and involve more senior team members? Case one, you receive a page just after sign out from a new nurse who reports that her patient is having a seizure. What's on your differential? So all normal differential diagnoses for seizure should be included in the oncologic population. These include electrolyte imbalances, hypoglycemia, toxicology, and primary epilepsy. Uh, additionally, what you should think about in the transplant population is cyclosporin side effects, busulfan side effects, and CNS bleeding. What do you want to ask the nurse on the phone? Are the vital signs stable? Does the patient carry a diagnosis of epilepsy? And particular to transplant, what day relative to stem cell infusion is the patient? This is something that you want to know actually about every stem cell transplant patient when you receive sign out. Knowing whether they're prior to stem cell infusion, shortly after stem cell infusion, or several weeks to months out will impact your differential and your interventions. The new bedside nurse may not know all of these information, but knowing where the patient is in the transplant process will make a difference. Once you arrive in the room, make sure the patient is on monitors and has oxygen hooked up. Ensure that you have IV access. Review the most recent lab studies to assess the risk of a CNS bleed or electrolyte imbalances and ask what medications the patient is taking. You learn that the patient just started busulfan and has a recent set of labs that are within normal limits. Busulfan is an alkylating agent that forms interstrand DNA crosslinks between purine bases. It is used primarily in stem cell transplant conditioning. In myeloablative regimens, it destroys rapidly dividing cells and is used to destroy marrow cells. Uh, and it is thought of as an alternative to radiation-based regimens. The urgent side effects and complications with busulfan include seizures and uh, veno-occlusive disease. The seizures are not dose-specific. Uh, most regimens that involve busulfan will use uh, seizure prophylaxis with either Keppra or phenytoin. If you have a patient who's seizing on busulfan, the treatment is the same for any other seizure. You want to stop the seizure with benzodiazepines. You want to give supportive care with oxygen. You want to make sure you have adequate access. And you should check a platelet count. The risk of seizures with busulfan returns to normal about 24 to 48 hours after administration. So if a patient received busulfan a week ago, this is not the cause of their seizure and you should go further. While it's not suggested by this particular presentation, the other main side effect that you should think about with busulfan is venoocclusive disease, which is also known as sinusoidal obstructive syndrome. This carries the triad of hepatomegaly uh, associated with right upper quadrant tenderness, uh, jaundice due to a direct hyperbilirubinemia, and then ascites and weight gain uh, with third spacing and decreased urine output. Another cause for seizure in this potential situation is cyclosporin. Cyclosporin is an immunosuppressive agent. It's not a conditioning agent, and it's used extensively in pediatric stem cell transplant to prophylax against graft-versus-host disease. It's also used in transplant rejection. PRESS, or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, it's usually but not always dose-related. The symptoms include headache, nausea, vomiting, confusion, 
Often patients will complain of decreased vision before progressing to seizures. Focal neurologic deficits are rare. It is diagnosed on imaging, on MRI, T2-weighted lesions of hyperintense or white signal, affecting the cortical and subcortical areas of the occipital and parietal lobes, and also the pons. This is a representative MRI showing you the uh, white changes in the cortical subcortical uh, areas. And you'll see that they are bilateral and diffuse as opposed to focal lesions. If you saw focality, one should be thinking of a hemorrhagic or infectious process. The seizures associated with cyclosporin often progress from ataxia and decreased mental status, although these early signs can be missed. There's a triad of high cyclosporin levels, low magnesium, and hypertension that usually lead to seizures. Once again, the seizures are managed with benzodiazepines, and they can be prophylaxed with Keppra, Phenytoin, or Ativan. The other complications of cyclosporin include uh, transplant-associated thrombomicroangiopathy, this often presents again with hypertension and edema and oligoeuria. The thing to know about this is uh, you can also see hemoglobinuria, so you want to check a urinalysis. And on a peripheral blood smear, schistocytes are noted. The treatment is to stop the offending agent. Often we will switch agents from cyclosporin to another calcineurin inhibitor. There is growing evidence about the use of ecolizumab, which is a uh, humanized anti-C5 antibody for the complement factor C5, which has been used in some situations. Another problem that you will encounter in the transplant unit with cyclosporin is type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Calcineurin inhibitors affect renal tubules and lead to magnesium wasting as well as bicarbonate losses and other cation losses. So if a patient is well appearing but presents on his uh, chemistries with a bicarbonate level in the teens, Often this is due to uh, cyclosporin, as opposed to sepsis or other causes. Let's move on to our second case. Now it's 3 a.m., and the nurse pages you that a patient uh, was admitted yesterday for conditioning. They began receiving cyclophosphamide with round-the-clock hyperhydration, and they haven't urinated in six hours. So let's just talk about cyclophosphamide. It is also an alkylating agent. It has a proclivity for lymphocytes. It is used in several conditioning regimens for graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis. It has a unique set of complications. It can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. It can cause a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone release. And it can also cause hemorrhagic myocarditis. So what's on your differential for a patient on cyclophosphamide who hasn't urinated in six hours? The first would be SIADH, and then the other would be cystitis. So SIDH associated with cyclophosphamide is actually not due to increased antidiuretic hormone. Uh, the direct effect on cyclophosphamide on the renal tubules is not clear, but it is a direct effect on the tubules that leads to excess water retention, and it is typically a short-lived problem. The management is to give isotonic or hypertonic hydration, and this can usually be helpful. Lasix can also be used for a patient who has fluid retention in this situation. In severe cases, bladder irrigation may be necessary in order to manage the potential for development of hemorrhagic cystitis without affecting intravascular water retention. The idea is that the cyclophosphamide is still collecting in the bladder. It can cause irritation in hemorrhagic cystitis. You need to get the cyclophosphamide out, and if the patient is not excreting urine on their own, uh, then you need to have a way to help uh, wash out the bladder. The more common cause of inappropriate urine output on a patient receiving cyclophosphamide is the cystitis. Acrolein is a major cyclophosphamide metabolite that is renally excreted. It irritates bladder wall lining and it can cause significant hemorrhagic cystitis but can actually lead to urethral obstruction. The prevention of hemorrhagic cystitis can be used one of two approaches. Uh, some centers will use mesna. This is an organosulfur compound that detoxifies metabolites such as acrolein by binding the sulfhydryl groups, and this prevents them from irritating the bladder wall lining. The other approach uh, that we use often in transplant is to give hyperhydration, which is IV fluids usually at one and a quarter to two times maintenance. To maintain a brisk urine output, uh, you want it approximately four to six cc's per kilo per hour. The idea is that you want the urine to be dilute, uh, and you'll be checking it for heme to make sure it's heme negative. If cystitis does develop, the goal is supportive management to prevent urethral obstruction. Often we'll increase the fluids to minimize obstruction, 
Uh, and again, if uh, we can increase fluids, we'll often consider a three-way Foley or even a suprapubic drain uh, with the idea that you want to flush the bladder to keep uh, blood clots from forming. Other things that can be tried is one will often maximize platelet levels and platelet thresholds. We can consider estrogen therapy or even bladder sclerosing agents. However, the important thing to know is that those last three indications are not things that would be introduced uh, in the middle of the night management. Initial night management is usually just to ensure uh, brisk and good urine flow. It's important to know that cyclophosphamide can also cause a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. This can actually lead to a potentially fatal hyponatremia when it's compounded by the hyperhydration and intravenous fluids administered to prevent the drug-induced cystitis. When managing patients on cyclophosphamide, we are often checking electrolytes more frequently and often checking urine and serum osmols to make sure that uh, we do not uh, inadvertently run into a situation of SIADH. Now to get back to our case, uh, what should you want to ask the nurse on the phone? You want to ask if the patient has had hematuria with any of their earlier voids. You want to ask if the patient is receiving mesna or hyperhydration. You want to actually ask the nurse to wake the patient and have a trial of voiding. Once you arrive in the room, you'll want to know, does the patient look edematous? Often this can be hard to tell if this is your first time seeing the patient, especially as many patients going through transplant already have a cushionoid appearance. The key areas to look are the eyelids and the face in general, or the ankles. You want to palpate the bladder and feel, does, uh, can you feel a full bladder or does bladder palpation lead to increased discomfort? Uh, if the patient is unable to void with uh, initial interventions, I would often start with a 10 cc per kilo normal saline bolus. You want to reevaluate then in about 60 to 90 minutes. If there's no response, you can consider a second bolus, but at that point, I would also consider sending chemistries, uh, including a Chem 7 and serum osms. The other thing one can do is to send a whole blood chemistries. Point of clarification. You can also consider sending whole blood electrolytes with your VBG, which will result sooner than the serum chemistry. You want to look at the sodium and the serum osms to see if they're low. Uh, and if they are, be prepared to try a loop diuretic such as Lasix. The other thing you may need to do is to change to isotonic or hypertonic saline to manage hyponatremia. If a patient is not voiding and is not receiving mesna, you may need to add that uh, as a way to help protect the bladder or once again uh, consider a three-way Foley as an alternative measure to prevent cystitis. If you do an initial 10 cc per kilo bolus and a patient does not respond to that, that should be a red flag and you should consider at that point calling the fellow or attending to escalate things up the decision tree. To round out our discussion of cyclophosphamide, let us quickly review hemorrhagic myocarditis which was not suspected by this case presentation. Hemorrhagic myocarditis is an exceedingly rare acute complication associated with cyclophosphamide. Its symptoms are those of acute congestive heart failure, including shortness of breath. It can be pulmonary edema, so one might hear Rowles on exam. There can be a pericardial rub, which one should listen for. possibly even arrhythmias. It is often associated with third spacing and fluid retention. Uh, an echo is very helpful because it will show concentric left ventricular thickening, which is actually due to blood interdigitating between the myocytes. Uh, the management uh, is with diuretics, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and beta blockers. Mild to moderate congestive heart failure might have small pericardial effusions, and these generally resolve within a few days. Two reports of supportive care, uh, including theophylline and vitamin C, showed some effectiveness at preventing this, although the evidence for these therapies remains limited and is not routinely used. Uh, most patients require aggressive monitoring and circulatory support of hemodynamics. Considerations could include ECMO or left ventricular assist devices to help reduce left ventricular afterload and prevent hypoperfusion related to injury. The mortality is high, but some patients do actually make a full recovery. Now let's just review a few more important side effects. I'm going to talk about a few agents that are commonly seen uh, in the transplant setting, uh, including atopicide, serotherapy agents, total body irradiation, and thiotepa. Atopicide is a toposomerase uh, 2 inhibitor. It's used in several high-dose chemotherapy regimens with autologous stem cell rescue. 
Uh, these are also known commonly as autologous stem cell transplants. They can be given either uh, as a short infusion over 30 to 60 minutes or as continuous infusions. The major issue associated with the topicide uh, in the uh, acute setting is hypotension. Often this can be managed by just slowing the infusion rate, uh, sometimes as much as 50%. If a patient is hypotensive, uh, the first thing to determine is if they're febrile. Not all hypertension due to atopicide infusion is actually due to the atopicide infusing. You want to evaluate a patient for hemodynamic stability. If they're unstable, you may need to temporarily stop the infusion. This is not a, a resident on-call decision. You should call the fellow or attending. Uh, they may need extra fluid just to fluid resuscitate them. Uh, and if necessary, they may need to be on some form of press or support. We have had patients in the past on both low-dose dopamine and continuous uh, infusion atopicide simultaneously. Serotherapy agents. These are antibodies that are directed against uh, human cellular epitopes. They include antithymocyte globulin, which comes both in a horse and rabbit form. And more commonly these days, Campath, uh, the generic name is alemtuzumab. This is a monoclonal antibody against uh, CD52, which is found on mature lymphocytes and is used in lymphocyte depleting regimens and often reduced intensity conditioning regimens. Both of these agents can cause a cytokine release syndrome. The way serotherapy agents can cause side effects is that the antibodies actually activate these T cells that they're binding before they're destroyed. The cytokines released by these activated T cells can produce a systemic inflammatory response very similar to that found in severe infection. Uh, and like severe infections, these can be characterized by hypotension, fevers, and rigors. The management often includes premedications with antihistamines, corticosteroids, and Tylenol. For equine or horse antithymocyte globulin, often higher doses of steroids are given around the infusion and if someone reacts, even more methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone to manage reactions. Total body irradiation is a common agent used in conditioning regimens for hematologic malignancies. Most regimens involve myoablative doses, which are considered greater than 800 centigrade. Uh, typically at Boston Children's Hospital, we're using doses uh, of 1320 or 1400 centigrade, given in uh, multiple fractions over several days. A unique complication of total body irradiation is parotitis, or inflammation of the parotid gland. This often occurs early, after the first or second dose. Uh, the inflammation of the parotid gland is transient. It can cause an excruciating jaw pain and swelling. It can be treated with opiates or actually even Tylenol, and hard candy or something that stimulates uh, salivation can help. Thiotepa. Uh, a unique feature of thiotepa is that it is lipophilic, so it easily penetrates the blood-brain barrier, or uh, it can easily penetrate cell walls, and it can easily get into body fluids such as sweat. Uh, and it can actually cause chemical burns to both patient and caregivers, uh, including family members. When patients are receiving thiotepa, and for 24 hours after their last dose of thiotepa, they should bathe or be sponge bath uh, at least every six hours. Uh, in general, we use only soap and water, and we want to be sure to thoroughly rinse the soap off. Skin folds need to be dried well and carefully, and we need to avoid rubbing of the skin or any sort of uh, irritation. Frequent changes of the patient's clothes, linens, and even CVL dressing have to occur every time he or she takes a bath. If the patient is in diapers, we change the diaper every three to four hours. We also have to clean the bottom well with a warm, moist washcloth. Uh, and importantly, we don't want to use any types of moisturizer or barrier creams during this time as they may actually trap the thiotepa excreted against the skin. We don't apply any antiperspirants or deodorants to the patients. In summary, I just wanted to talk uh, briefly about, again, the things that we covered today uh, with the agents that we talked about. And again, this is not expected to be a comprehensive review. But with busulfan, one should think about the unique complications of venoocclusive disease and seizures. With cyclosporin, you want to think about uh, press or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. You want to think about seizures, uh, microtubular or renal angiopathy, and renal tubular acidosis. With cyclophosphamide, the two main complications seen early in transplant are hemorrhagic cystitis and an SIADH-like syndrome. And you want to be aware of the 
a rare but potentially fatal complication of hemorrhagic myocarditis. Uh, Atoposide can cause hypotension. Uh, serotherapy agents can cause a cytokine storm uh, exhibited by hypotension, rigors, and fevers. Uh, total body irradiation can cause an immediate jaw pain, and thiotepa can cause chemical burns. Thank you for watching this video on conditioning side effects on hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and I hope you learned something. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.